Okay, everyone, I think we can go ahead and get started. Live stream's good. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming today. Um, I really appreciate it. Before I give the floor over to Webb and his team, I just kind of wanted to give some brief background on the Arts Council and sort of the origin of this study. So for years, the Arts Council has been hosting their events in venues such as the resort conference centers, local churches, and they've just been finding it increasingly difficult to schedule these venues. So they asked the town to consider commissioning a feasibility study to determine the possibility of having a permanent venue to mitigate some of the issues. Um, so Webb was selected by a steering committee made up of members of town council, arts council, and town employees. Um, so for the past few weeks, they've been collecting information from different stakeholders, but today they kind of want to hear just from the community. They've got a brief presentation, and then I think they just want to open it up for an interactive Q&A, a great chance for everyone to learn. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Duncan. And the clicker is right there. Thank you, Ruthie. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all. What a beautiful place to hold a meeting. I love looking out the windows here to see your wonderful location. Hi, right, come on in. Um, let me also introduce Miriam King, my associate here, who's doing a lot of the legwork around uh, this study for us. So uh, what I'm going to do uh, today is um, make some quick introductions. I'm going to tell you the process that we've uh, begun to do this study on and for Keough Island. Um, I thought it would be fun to share with you some of the broader forces and trends that we're seeing in the arts and entertainment sectors today. There's a lot that's changing and it's making all of our lives very complicated, but, but fascinating. Uh, and, then, um, uh, and then I want to kind of uh, uh, encourage discussion, see if there are questions and issues that are important to you that you'd like to share. So this meeting is being recorded and live streamed, so for those uh, uh, of you not here today, there will be opportunities to provide your input and feedback on what you hear. At the end of this, I'm going to provide a couple of links to places where you can deliver additional feedback uh, in the weeks to come. So um, I'll introduce ourselves. So we are uh, management consultants to people who build and operate uh, facilities. So uh, I started doing this work uh, now 30 four years ago. Um, uh, I did it in a couple of other firms, uh, but I started this practice now, uh, it's going to be 26 years in March. We just started Project 499, which is sort of exciting. We've planned a party in January to celebrate uh, the 500 project, so I hope one more comes in between now and January 13th, otherwise it'll be a bit strange. But um, uh, but that, that point is important about the, the fact that we do lots of these short assignments. So we, it's a terrible business model, um, you know, because essentially we, our job is to come into town, figure things out, speak truth to power, and then get out of the way. So we have no vested interest in the outcome of our work. We're not hanging around for more work. This is not about another assignment in Kiowa. We're here to provide professional, objective, honest, research-based analysis that will help you as a community decide if you should do something and if so, what. Um, so we've had uh, a, a lot of experience up and down um, this part of the coast. Um, some of our favorite projects in Virginia Beach, we did that Sandler Center up there years ago. Uh, we recently did a, finished the project in Myrtle Beach where the city is taking over an old downtown theater called the Broadway Theater and renovating it. And we helped write a business plan so that, um, uh, I forget, is it Coastal Carolina University is going to come and operate that venue. So we helped the city in Coastal Carolina make a deal as to how they would operate that venue as a part of a down, what's called the Arts and Innovation District. And, downtown Myrtle Beach. I did a project in, uh, in Hilton Head, 
I guess it was three years ago, maybe four years ago now, uh, that was they 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 wanted to explore the idea of new and improved facilities. Um, uh, that was a boy. The public got super active and engaged in that one. We had some very raucous public meetings talking about issues on and off the island, which I serve many of the same issues that, that are here. Uh, and then further, a little bit further down the coast in uh, Brunswick, um, we did a feasibility study a couple of years ago. Oh, and I'm going to forget the name of that university in Brunswick. It's Coastal University of Georgia. Anyways, it's a former two-year college. It's now a four-year college in Brunswick, and they're going to build a, a I think a thousand seat hall coming out of that study. So um, it's great to be back in the area. We've always enjoyed uh, working in this part of the country um, uh, for many reasons. So um, here, the the process that we're we're embarking upon is one that we've basically developed uh, over 30 years. Uh, and the way that we do it is that we split the work into two phases. And the first phase is called the needs assessment. And the purpose of the needs assessment is to determine what, if any, facilities make sense from a market perspective. So there are four questions. Number one, is there an audience for facilities? So who lives here, uh, who visits here, and here, What's important is understanding that there's three very distinct segments of the market, right? There's a full-time market, there's a seasonal population, and then there are tourists. And they're all quite different, and their needs and interests are quite different. So we have to sort out those three different segments of the market and understand um, if they are likely to participate. If there was something here, you know, would they get up from the beach or the couch or wherever they are and go and participate in an event? The second issue, which to me is always the most important one, is who's going to use it. So who are the local artists and arts organizations and educators and promoters of touring entertainment that need and want access to something more than they currently have? And if you add up all of that demand, does it suggest that you might have a busy building? Because really? that's the most important test is, will the lights be on enough nights of the year for this to make sense, right? You don't want to do something where it only lights up 50 to 75 nights a year. You want it to be busy, 100, 150 nights, 200 nights and days um, in, order to, in order for this to be sort of justified as an investment for your community. So the third issue then, so that's two kinds of demand. So, and, and we always think first in terms of a, of a performance space, but it's similar in all spaces who's in the audience or who's looking at an exhibition or who's taking a class versus who's on the stage, who's putting up the paintings, or who's teaching the class. So user demand and, and audience demand, active demand and passive demand uh, uh, against the supply. But then the fourth issue, which is the thing that always makes these projects so interesting is we say, where is your community going and how does a project like this help you get there? So for Kiowa Island, what are your goals around uh, economic development and uh, maintaining or building a high quality of life for people who live here? Or if there's an interest in wanting to drive additional tourism, what are those goals? Because those priorities uh, would shape this project, right? If this is really about sort of driving quality of life, it's a different thing than if it's really about driving tourism. So we need to understand those broader goals in the community. So we'll do that work and that will lead us to uh, fundamental conclusions on if something is needed uh, uh, and if so, what, right? From a broader perspective. So that's that column that gets us through that work. Then if there's a concept and there's a consensus uh, amongst the, the leadership team here on the island and others that we're headed in a good direction, we'll keep going. And what we'll do is a little tiny little bit of physical planning uh, and then a little bit of business planning. So the physical planning will be done by uh, Robert Long, uh, who's a terrific fellow who's based in Chapel Hill uh, and has very strong roots. He grew up in Rock Hill um, uh, and has worked with us up and down the, the 
the coast for many years, a wonderful man. Uh, and he's going to sort of write what's called a space program, which is a list of every room in the building. You need this size of lobby, and you need these many dressing rooms. You need this amount of, for storage. And here's how big the, the rehearsal room is. And we want three classrooms, and maybe there's this. And he sort of adds it all up into a big list of spaces. And, you have, and he starts with kind of net square footage, which is the interior measurement of a room like this. And then he turns that into gross square footage, which adds corridors and circulation spaces and wall thicknesses and others to give us the size of the building. Then he'll probably also say something about what the footprint is. So if it's a 30,000 square foot building, maybe the footprint is somewhere between you know, 15 and 20,000 square feet, the amount of area that you need to take up on a piece of land. Um, and then we'll probably also say something about parking, you know, some rules of thumb about how many parking spaces you need to have given certain sizes of the spaces. So he'll do that, and then uh, together we'll do a very rough uh, order magnitude budget. Here's how much we think it might cost to build this building. And that's a very treacherous thing to do these days because construction costs have been escalating so quickly for the past uh, two years. But we'll give it a shot, and we'll probably do something in ranges just to be sort of fairly conservative about the whole thing. And then will Robert, so, so space program and cost. So we're not going to talk, within the context of our work, we're not going to place the building at a certain location. We're not going to analyze a bunch of different sites. Um, we're just going to say, here's essentially the footprint, here's the size of the building, and, and here's roughly what it's going to cost to do it. Right? The question of siting and sort of traffic implications, we will be available to support you in doing that analysis. But we're, we're sort of separating that a little bit from our work. Um, so then while the physical planning is going on, what Miriam and I will be doing is writing a business plan. So here's how you bring that building to life. Here's how you operate it. What kind of organization should it be town operated? Or should you have a private nonprofit operator? Or should you get a college or a school to come and operate it? Um, what kind of staff do you need? What sort of policy do you need to make it available to the key user groups? My favorite event in the business plan is we have something called the scheduling charrette, where we invite all the potential users to come together, and we sit around a big conference table, and we put a blank calendar down on the table or every month in an opening year, and we say, let's pretend the building is about to open. Now let's talk about how you book your dates. So when do you want to perform and how many rehearsal days and let's talk about rent and how far in advance you need to book your dates and how you want to use a ticketing system and what food and beverage opportunities are you interested in. So it's, you know, it's in one sense, it's way too early to have those sorts of discussions, but it's always we find very important to get the users engaged in thinking about how the building will work for them as and when it opens. And that session helps us uh, write policy, operating policy. Here's how ticketing should work. Here's how security, here's how you deal with backstage labor, and here's how much you charge to the various groups. So we do all of that, um, and we'll and then build the operating pro forma, which is we start with earned revenue, all the activity, and then you um, uh, figure out all the operating expenses. And then that the gap then is the is the contributed income piece. So how much money will you need to raise every year in order to sustain these facilities? And that the, the discussion we always have is um, contributed income is not a reflection of, of poor management. Uh, it's not that we don't know how to run like a business. It's the nature of arts facilities, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is that they do need contributed income to sustain themselves in order that they are available to the artists and arts organizations and audiences that want to access them. You can't charge market rate rent to everyone and have these buildings be busy. It just doesn't work. So we'll do the pro forma and we'll talk about annual uh, funding. And then we'll also do a little bit of an economic impact analysis that suggests the impact that the building might have on the, the region in terms of new sales, earnings, and job creation. All right. So let me just stop there. Are there any questions or comments on that process and what we're doing? Sir? Uh -huh. Let's see if I can do that. For my clarification, um, it says your management principles 
consultant specializing in the development and operation of consulting right. the cultural facilities? Right. Are you simply consulting or do you actually do development and operation? No, no, we don't we don't operate. So but we do so our work in operation is we do a fair amount of strategic planning in existing buildings. So right now we have three strategic plans going for existing arts facilities and helping them think about the future. And then back to the, the second slide. Yeah. Uh, so is our, the scope of our view of the engagement you have with the town, and Ruby, I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to, to, to discuss this with you, does it include both columns? Yes. So we've already essentially paid for both. Right. But it's certainly possible you never get past the first column. Correct. Right. Uh, but doesn't it would seem to me that you know, whether you're citing available, the cost of acquisition of that might be, et cetera, would be critical to answering the feasibility question in the first call. Well, not, not our kind of feasibility. I mean, it's, that would be critical around the question of fundraising feasibility, but not in terms of the, the market opportunity for the building. Okay, so the first column is simply whether you think it's, there's it's, the market opportunity, yes. Yeah. And, and, then, and then with regard to that, what I heard you say was, um, uh, you know, it only makes sense to be open 250 nights rather than 75. Right. But, but that seems like a conclusion that, you know, that's already prejudged regardless of what market demand may be. Um, so, and, and, and well, I, we just... You know, it's hard to come into a community to say, yes, you should spend X million dollars for a building that might only be open 50 to 75 nights a year. And that's a that's a tough the, sell. I, I'm trying to think of things like the Highlands Playhouse or Uncle's Playhouse. Right. Are they open 200 or you could probably walk us through? So we, we, we were, we'll do, we're doing research on comparable projects and we'll show you examples of other places and how they're busy. And, yeah. And, and, and it also sounds like there was also already some kind of as to at least preliminary conclusion that it's not necessarily just a performing space that there is you'd also you know that the assumption is there'd be additional space for arts for classes right things like that. right yeah so good good I'm glad you raised that so you know when people talk about these projects we all tend to gravitate first to this the theater you know how big is it what's it do but but the space the other things you can put around a performance space are often equally important in in advancing a good project. Whether that means this is not, we're not doing a full-blown sort of visual arts thing, but but obviously having some kind of gallery or exhibit space is often a great thing. Having a rehearsal space, having classrooms for active arts participation rather than simply passive arts participation. So with the blessing of the town, we are we are going beyond simply exploring the demand for an auditorium. Sir? Is, is there agreement with the town as to the sort of logical uh, yes no decision points um, during the course of the study? Well, we wrote in our proposal that there is a, at the end of this first phase, there is a moment when we are going to articulate a concept and we are going to give the town the option to say, you know, thanks very much, see you later, or let's continue on to sort of flesh out that concept a little bit because we think it's potentially interesting. Yep. What's the time horizon on your first call? Uh, three, three months. 90 days from today or? Well, we're sort of into it now, so hopefully within 60 days, I would say. Yeah. This may be a premature question, but do you know where you're going to look for comparability? And the reason I ask that is Virginia Beach has 1.5 million residents. Myrtle Beach has over 400,000 residents. Brunswick, Georgia, which you also mentioned, has between undergraduates and full-time something like 19,000 people. You are in a space where we have maybe 2,000 voters, not all of whom are full-time. And if you add the part-timers, we have eight or 9,000 people. And I'm trying to right. figure out how you, how you even start with comparability. 
Well, there are lots of smaller sort of resort communities around the country that have developed facilities. Um, uh, we just finished a project in the Hamptons that is a little bit different, but, but interesting. Um, it's also, I find it's interesting when we look at sort of winter resort communities as well as summer resort communities. So we've done facilities in places like uh, Stowe, Vermont, which is a sort of tiny town with that sort of seasonality to it. A bunch of projects in the Rockies and further west, small resort communities that have added arts facilities. So it is incumbent upon us to find good comparable projects that are about markets that are similar to this, considering projects that might be akin to what we're recommending, which we don't know yet. So it's, it's too early for us to speculate about what those are, but rest assured that we will find places that hopefully pass that test. Okay, yes ma'am. Well, that's, that's an excellent segue into this next set of slides. So it is true. That was an event we held 10, 15 years ago, I think. And we were sort of thinking about these buildings back then. And, and yes, a lot of that is happening. So let me do the next part of this, which where I'm going to talk, share with you what we consider to be some of the important uh, forces and trends <coughs> in the sector today. And I often frame this as as bad news and good news. So I'll do the bad news first. So the bad news in the, in the art sector is that it's that audiences for traditional performing arts disciplines like classical music and ballet and opera is declining. Uh, they're not being taught in the schools. The, some of those audiences are sort of aging out and then we see a decline. And we, the, the group we've been watching mostly is the 18 to 24 year olds and how their participation in various disciplines is declining. There are lots of theories about why that's happening. Uh, I, I think a, a part of it is that they don't like traditional spaces. You know, They don't like the way they're told to go in and sit down and face the front and turn the ring off and pay attention and this is what it means. Younger consumers want to have more control over their experience and that kind of thing doesn't work for them. So we're concerned about that. So that's declining. Uh, the market for m other types of entertainment, more commercial music and broader forms of cultural heritage and creativity, that's increasing. But the traditional disciplines are struggling a little bit. The second issue is that uh, nonprofit arts organizations, the economic challenges on them are, are big and getting bigger. And again, I, I, I quote that. I think people oft often say, well, the problem in the arts is you just don't know how to run yourselves like a business. And that's just categorically not true. The, the challenge in the arts is that there, there are no productivity gains uh, over time in the way that art is created. It's the same all the time. It takes the same energy and time and whatever it is upstairs that you have to create art. Whereas in the commercial world, like in our business and other businesses, every year you figure out ways to be a little bit more productive. And those productivity gains are important because they help you keep up with increases in costs. But the problem for the art sector is because productivity gains don't occur, every year it gets a little bit harder to balance the budget. And what that's meant in the sector is more economic pressure and the need for more contributed income to sustain arts organizations. So whenever we're doing things for nonprofit, for artists and nonprofit arts organizations, we have to be mindful of the fact that they have limited economic capacity to pay sort of high rent or full rent or market rate rent for access to facilities. And we need to do our best to support them given these very substantial economic challenges that they have. The next thing is a fundraising is tough. Fundraising is very competitive both in the private sector and in the public sectors. So on the public sector, You've got pension obligations and all sorts of other issues that municipalities are dealing with, and it's, and a lot of cities find it hard 
to have a, a line item funding for the arts. It's sort of politically, a, it's a tough sell. Um, so what has happened there is that the arts, government funding of the arts has gone from being direct funding to being indirect funding. So the arts still gets money from government, but it tends to get it from different parts of government. It comes from an economic development, or it comes through a juvenile justice program, or it comes through education, or it comes through transportation, or it comes through tourism. So what that means is the arts, we need to connect to these sort of broader issues in order to uh, advocate for government support. And then on the private sector side, we also have challenges. Uh, new causes like environmental sustainability and social justice are, are essentially competing for, for funding. So again, we need to make sure that when we're advocating for the arts, we are talking about our role in social justice and in environmental sustainability and all those things in order that we can continue to receive private sector support. So that's the bad news. The good news is um, uh, the growth of active arts participation. So uh, much more often these days, uh, people are interested in not just sitting in an audience or looking at a painting, but in actually being on stage and learning an instrument or learning how to paint. And arts facilities need to sort of respond to that sort of interest on the part of consumers. Um, secondly, and related to that, so arts education in schools all over the country has been sort of on the decline for a long time. But what's happened is that the nonprofit art sector has sort of jumped in to that world. And most nonprofit arts organizations now have robust and sophisticated education and outreach programs that for which they're able to fundraise successfully. So a lot of the financial support that nonprofit arts groups get now comes through their ability to deliver education and outreach programs around the country. And then finally, I would say um, we, we are finally through, because of things like the National Endowment for the Arts, able to articulate a strong value proposition for the arts. You know, we, it would be nice if we lived in a world where we could say the arts are wonderful, let's support the arts. But we don't. We live in a world where we have to express what is the value and, uh, and importance of the arts and why should we as a community invest. So we're able to talk about the role of the arts in economic development and recruiting companies and enhancing quality of life. And one of my favorites and an area that Miriam is particularly strong in is, is talking about the role and relationship between the arts and health, whether it's about uh, teaching dance to uh, Parkinson's patients or using poetry for PTSD sufferers. And, and there's an amazing world that's sort of opening up there where the arts is delivering value on the basis of those good things. So good news and bad news. So um, the second part of that is I'll say, here's how, here's how buildings are, are responding to these changes. First of all, we, we embrace a broader definition of cultural activity. We are not about the work of sort of dead white European men anymore. We are really trying to be more sort of diverse and inclusive when we think about culture and what that means. Um, my favorite soundbite is we say we've gone from Friday night lights to the community living room. So the old image of a, of a theater was the marquee lights up at seven o'clock on a Friday night and fancy people wearing their fancy clothes show up to a fancy performance. The new image of a theater is the building is open all day, every day. It's much more active, it's much more inclusive, and it is a place where people go. It becomes the third place after home and work where the community gathers. And that new image of a theater is very powerful and positive. Uh, third, we, are, we do a lot more work now trying to partner with educators, whether that's in the secondary, primary, or secondary schools, or uh, post-secondary schools, bringing them into these buildings. Um, a really important shift is we've gone from uh, palaces to districts. So back in the 60s and 70s, we built these palaces of the arts. You think of the Kennedy Center and Lincoln Center. And Lincoln Center wiped out an entire neighborhood in New York to create this sort of palace of the arts. Um, now we've, we, we've flipped that. You know, we're much more interested now in developing arts facilities within an urban or semi-urban sort of area, uh, somewhat dispersed. We, we love arts districts because they are 
more inclusive. They use existing buildings whenever possible. They can be developed over time. They can support commercial development. And importantly, uh, tourists, visitors love districts. They tend not to embrace palaces of the arts, these giant sort of iconic architectural things, but they love districts. Districts become a destination where people can do multiple things, go to a performance, see an exhibit, have a bite to eat, do some shopping, walk around. So pa districts are, are a great innovation. Um, so we're trying to support active as well as passive participation in buildings. Um, we're also trying to work hard to enhance the social experience around going to a performance or an exhibition. You know, this, this old image of pushing people in, sit down, face the front, be quiet, pay attention, and then when it's over, lights come up, push, 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 you're out of the building again. We're trying to change that. We're trying to give more opportunities for people to come to the building to just be there, whether it's for a coffee or a bite to eat or a, or a beer. They hang around for a rehearsal. Or they see an exhibition. They're there before performance. Maybe they're there after performance because that social experience is a very powerful part of the overall piece of it. Um, we really work hard to maintain a low cost of access for artists and arts organizations and, and why that's important. And finally, the, you know, the, the architects used to say, you know, the, a theater starts with the stage. You know, it all, you, know, you look at the stage first and then you design out from there. But what we say is the first thing you have to do is look around your community and pay attention to what's going on in your community and create something and sustain something that is connected to the issues and goals and challenges in your community. So um, now a, a couple more sort of more speculative things. We're also thinking in thinking ahead now, there's, there's more change coming. So we learned about streaming during the pandemic and some people are continuing to try streaming. I think it's a little bit earlier to say how permanent it will be, but we're sort of paying close attention to that. Uh, we are advocating in a lot of our buildings uh, for the idea of automating systems, uh, lighting systems, sound systems, rigging, seating, uh, food and beverage, because the big problem in a lot of these buildings today is uh, labor shortages and the high cost of labor. So we're saying in communities that are relatively good at raising capital funds, we would encourage you to spend extra money to, to build in automated systems because in the long run, that's going to, going to make it easier to sustain the facility. Um, I don't know if any of you have participated in any of these immersive experiences, but that technology is advancing rapidly, these sort of projection mapping. And, and is there some way that we bring that into this? There are some big halls now that are doing some immersive experiences around a classical music performance. Uh, if anyone's been to the New World Symphony in, my, in Miami Beach, they have these giant screens that are showing colors and pictures and images during a classical music performance. So maybe there's something there. But whatever it is, we know that the building in the future is going to have, a, have to have a very strong sort of technology infrastructure, you know, power and Wi-Fi and routers and all the things that, because it is quite likely, and particularly with younger audiences, that you, your mobile device is going to be part of the experience. Right? And we're doing this now in sports a lot. And, so we have to think about how we create that experience for others. Okay, final slide, and then I, we get to listen to you all a little bit more. So the questions are, what, what do you think about these things? Is there an audience? And if so, for what? Who are the audio, art, artists, organizations, and educators needing space? What facilities do you think are missing, both locally and regionally? What broader goals should guide the development of new facilities? What have you seen in other places that might work here? And finally, what are your concerns about potential new facilities? That's your cue. Mm -hmm. Sir. Uh, I'm, I'm Dan Prickett. I co-chair the art field here on the field. And that field is today about 40 to 40 45 million principally uh, artists painting in watercolors and oils. Uh, we need, uh, interestingly, typically not at night. Daytime space for a gallery would be great. The town allows us to use the public space out here as a gallery, which mm -hmm. is very helpful. We could use more. We have three to four 
four uh, workshops a year, which last from three to five days, where groups of a dozen artists come in and are taught by a, a person that's brought in from another part of the country or from Charleston to teach for three or four days. Um, in those cases, the students pay for that, so we can pay for a facility during the day for mm. people like that. We also have workshops. Uh, we like to get together and paint together, which is very difficult because most people's homes wouldn't qualify as being big enough. So having some, what I'll call studio space during the day would also be very helpful to the um, And I think if we had things like that, instead of 40 people, we might have 60 people. You know, it would grow it would allow us to do that. Um, but that would be very useful. And, and those people who are involved with, let's call it visual arts, also tend to be people who like the performing arts. So, you know, it's part of the community. Mm -hmm. Having it um, in and around other facilities, and I'm, I know you're not pointing out where, but Freshfields is a good example. People go there because of all the stuff going there. Um, and it's nice because there's parking already available, especially at night when the traffic crowds go down. At 8 o'clock, there's no parking. So I would, I'm sure you're going to look at that, but that would be more of an interesting location. I don't think we can afford to be behind the it's just too many roadblocks for the rest of the community. Because I think we can draw from Johns Island and from Seabrook and from other places around here. I think we have to so. Thank you. Sure, there's, there's several elements to it. One is, so it's the size of the market, the growth potential in the market, the demographic characteristics of the market. We do this thing called geodemographics. We have this, uh, this uh, program called uh, Tapestry, put out, put out by this big market research company that breaks the world, everyone down into 72 clusters with silly names that's that's about their lifestyle. So in, in if we give them a geographic area, they will tell us who the dominant lifestyle clusters are in the area. So demographics, geodemographics, we buy another piece of research that tells us about the propensity of people living in a certain area to participate in classical music, dance, popular music. So we'll have that index. Um, uh, so it's all of the above. So it's the size of the market, the growth of the market, the characteristics of the market, and then we will also um, say with those comparable projects, can a market of this size support something of that size? So it's largely theoretical. Well, it's th partly theoretical, but it's but it's also pointing to real examples where it's happened. So we can we will find as we promise the projects of a market sort of uh, comparable to, to these where there is an example of something similar to what we've suggested, if in fact we're gonna recommend anything. Thank you, and my second question is whether or not you've been involved in projects that are either similar to what you suggested or similar to what you Because the people listening can't hear. Okay. So the right. So I need to repeat the question. So it was. Uh, there are, are there hybrid facilities that do other things? So yes. Yeah, so so often uh, I would say a lot of our facilities are also very much in the meeting and event business. That's the most common sort of secondary activity uh, because uh, classrooms, rehearsal spaces, and performance spaces tend to be very attractive for meetings and special events, sort of beyond traditional arts and entertainment users. So that tends to be the first sort of ancillary business 
that we look to. Um, there are other cases where it, it, it goes from sort of, of a community art center to more of a community center where there are exercise programs, whether it's Zumba or yoga or whatever, that are community related um, ancillary to the core purpose, which is around arts and entertainment. So I would say there are, there are lots of different add-ons that are possible depending on what's here, but the, the challenge we always have is we don't want the, it's, we don't want the tail to wag the dog. If there's, an, if there's this overwhelming need for exercise facilities and a little bit of need for art stuff, that's probably a different solution. But if there's an arts thing and then maybe some other things that make sense and some of those other things improve the financial sustainability of the center, then it's worth pursuing them. Right. Do you want to do yeah, Absolutely. Um, and just to circle back to the market question, we are purchasing demographics that use U.S. Census and um, American survey data. So we are using actual data to support it, not just hypothetical. Um, for right now, our position is considering the local market as Kiowa, Seabrook, and Charles Island. And the regional market is a 60 minute drive time from, um, we chose Town Hall to Point. Um, but from Kiowa and a radius. Um, so the regional market is a 60 minute drive time. And of course that varies with traffic, um, but that captures the majority of Charleston County as well. Okay, let's go here. Um, I have a mic because people can't hear you. When you're Great. Mic Great, thank you. Um, the concept of market, after having read your proposal, is a major concern to me. Um, the Kiowa Arts Council is the town of Kiowa. It is not a county council. It's not a regional council. And yet your proposal talks about market areas, and I'm quoting, um, uh, uh, the areas for new performing arts facilities on Kiowa Island and in the Charleston County and region, and to assess gaps in the Kiowa Island, Beaufort County region. I'm not sure why we should be concerned about unmet regional needs. Um, as a town, we're at the end of, a, end of a dead end road, really, mm. and I'm not sure that the economic impact of new performing arts facilities in Charleston County should be a concern. Um, I'm not sure driving additional tourist visits to the end of the road here should be I don't think it's a good thing. I'm here 21 years. Um, and the problems that were exposed when we looked at this 15 years ago, many of them have only gotten worse. And I will share those concerns with your team. Uh, I was president of the Kiwa uh, Property Owners Group at the time. We wrote several editorials. And those concerns were never addressed. In fact, I think that the major reason the project was killed at that time was because there were not, there, there was insufficient funding to develop the facility. So this goes back to your funding. Right. Wait, wait. Um, my name's Tom Wright. I've been a property owner here since 1980, so I've seen lots of change. Uh, we have a complete void in things to do at night in this area, whether you're a tourist or a resident, and quite often we can't figure out who the residents are because so many people are non-residents that it screws up things like census reports. But uh, the Arts Council has done a phenomenal job of sort of pulling rabbits out of a hat. I've spent more than 30 years on the board of three small regional theaters. Um, I one in a big city in Houston, Texas, which uh, had to survive during a couple of crashes in the oil market. One in a large festival in Chicago, Ravinia Festival, where mm. I was on the executive board, Great. responsible for our 
small Martin Theater, which is one of the most successful small theaters, I think, in the country. Um, and in the town of Glencoe, where I live, with 6,000 people, nobody knows where Glencoe is, but it's on the North Shore of Chicago. Um, we started with everybody wanted something that was more arts-like. In 1992, a small group of individuals decided they would like to be a theater group. And in the back of a bookstore, which could hold about 25 or 30 people at full capacity, um, started the theater. They uh, used uh, probably mostly uh, new performances of new, of new writings and uh, did quite well. The town got a little bit of reputation. There was a women's club that had a funny little building in town. They moved into that for some of their performances and shared their space. Eventually, it became popular. The town underwrote the destruction, uh, demolition of the women's club building. They raised some money. The town contributed a lot of money. And they built a theater. They had Studio Gang. It has a lot of the concepts you talk about. Um, very flexible space, space they can use for arts, arts things during the daytime. It is used extensively for town events because there's nothing else. We have, you could never find a bigger void than what you have in Kiowa. There's not one single decent facility within any miles, within 25 miles of here, including Kiowa. The, the arts people put on these things and, and just extremely challenging venues. Um, we found almost immediately that we could find sponsors. Um, the, the theater group has done very well, does do, not use probably 30 nights, 40 nights a year for them. Um, but with sponsors and others, um, the Wall Street Journal has called it the best small theater group in America the last three years. So we've done fairly well in the luck of having a, a good arts group. We hold election debates. We hold town meetings. We hold anything that needs an audience in the town. And it has turned out to be a phenomenal uh, attraction and a benefit. In a, place here where you have nothing at night that, that's suitable for anyone in the area on the island. Um, it seems like you could find a way to run these. The good news is, yes, you still have to raise a little bit of money. They don't make money. Um, the ones at Ravinia, uh, we took up. I was on the board. When I went on the board there, we were a struggling festival doing all the things you say nobody does anymore, classical music, opera, dance all those things. It is now the most successful festival, I think, in America by quite a wide margin. Um, we, we changed, we pushed very hard to, to broaden it, to more jazz, more, more uh, cultural events related to different um, uh, I don't know, groups. Um, but we filled the nights, we filled a lot of nights, we can't do a lot of we have an outdoor stage. You can't do much with that in the winter in Chicago. Um, but the actual Martin Theater that I was responsible for, we do events all year round. We attract interesting talent. You can get chamber music people. We can get Broadway singers. We can get jazz musicians. You're not going to see Elton John there. Um, but it turns out that people will fill out 600 seat place. And you can reconfigure it, whether it's a circle or a traditional stage. And we use a lot of technology. The technology is, is sometimes music to, to back up a one-person play, sometimes the pictures and the artwork that goes with it. But it turns out to be, if you check the little uh, website, it's one of the most popular places at the festival in the small town at Glencoe. They basically say, home of the Writers' Theater. And the Writers' Theater is the heart of the town in a very small theater in the town. And I. I find it amazing we have nothing here. We, we haven't got a place with any acoustics for the whole place. So Great. I would be happy to talk further. We, we raised a lot of money here now. Ravinia went from having no money to having $100 million. I'm sorry, Thank did you, you want to comment? OK. Mr. LaPuma. Uh, my name is Charlie LaPuma. I have a long history with the Arts Council, <clears throat> which, which many here are aware of. And I have 
concerns about this thing getting, getting out of hand and getting away. <clears throat> Some very appropriate questions were asked about the market. Our original market for the Arts Council was Kiowa. Now, as a municipality, we could not prevent people from Seabrook, Johns Island, or Iowa from coming and attending our performances. So we need to be very careful to define what is our market or what are we shooting for. Secondly, once you have that, you have to decide what physical facilities do you need to satisfy that market. And that gets into you know, size, location, uh, the construction of the facility, the maintenance and operation of the facility, and to look at that long term, say down a, a, a 10 year period of time, to look at the cash flows in and out. Because I think most of these rely <coughs> very heavily on donations. And there are places where you know, huge donations are made to keep these things operating. Uh, without that, where, where are your funds coming from? I doubt that you'll be able to uh, ha have a, 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 a business that is, is self-generating the funds that are needed to build it, to pay the mortgage, to, to do all, all of the rest of it. Uh, so you need to think carefully about uh, the long term, where does the money come from? And, and if the thinking is the town of Kiowa will uh, provide that money, uh, I mean, that, that's one approach, and, and the townspeople can decide that. But at some point in time, the town will run out of money, and they'll have to start thinking about uh, you know, having real estate tax, uh, like you have in Charleston, North Charleston, and, and, and most other places. So there are a lot of very complex issues that need to be considered and thought about. And, and um, personally, I, I'd love to see something which would be limited to the Kiwa uh, circle, if you will, and, 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 uh, and not something that's going to be regional. Because you have performing arts centers, uh, you have the, the Galliard, you have all, all of these other, other things which are ent entirely different. So th there are some very critical uh, things to consider very carefully, especially the costs. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, my name is Paul Hennessy. I'm a relatively recent resident. So I guess the obvious question is, um, are, is Keough Island Real Estate a partner in this endeavor? They, they have the, they have the, they have uh, a potential interesting um, stake in that they've got tons of people who are here anyway, and maybe in terms of uh, Madeline's point about a hybrid kind of, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Can you stand up so we can hear <laughs> Okay. So the, the question is whether in, in, the, in the spirit of a hybrid facility, whether the Kiwa Island partners would be interested in some sort of venture. Um, yeah, potentially. We, you know, we're not going to answer that question within the context of our work. We'll develop a concept, and if the town decides uh, that um, it's worth going down that road with them, we'll do. We did interview some, I think we interviewed a couple of folks connected to the, the, the development company and the management of the, the management company. Uh, I believe the resort. The resort, right. Just, just try, trying to understand their sort of longer term sort of vision and goals without necessarily talking about how this project might align with those. We just wanted to learn what's important to them going forward. So we collected that. Okay. Does any of the art council members like to say anything or no? I'm gonna come right behind you. 
I'll stand for you. <laughs> My name's Joe Thompson. Uh, first of all, I want to commend the, the town for engaging in this process and the Arts Council for all the work that they do. Um, and I, I want to take the view that I think we should have a broader perspective on this. I think it's commendable for the town to put the energy and effort into looking at the feasibility study. <clears throat> and that's the whole purpose of doing this, is to figure out what's possible and how. But I do think that we need to look at ourselves as Johns Island residents, not just Kiowa residents, because that's what we are. And I think the benefits that we can get in serving our local community outside of the Kiowa gates and what we can bring to the table as far as interest in the arts moving forward, particularly with all the new uh, housing developments going in and those families that will be looking for this type of service would be really um, tremendous. So thank you. Yeah, my name is David Wool, and I'm the vice chair of the Arts Council. And I, and I just, uh, and Duncan at the beginning sort of uh, mentioned the, the be how this began. But part of our problems, and one of my jobs on the Arts Council is to sort of listen to all the Arts Council members in terms of what they want to bring, the artists and things. And then my job has been to sort of find out where they can do it. Like, is West Beach available on November 10th? Or do we have to go to Seabrook? Or is the church available? And I can tell you in the four years that I had been doing it, the job has gotten increasingly difficult. I can tell you West Beach is great and the resort does a fabulous job at marketing in terms of conferences. It's used tremendously. So if someone says, oh, we, you know, we, we already have a facility that seats 600 and it's, it's on the island and they're, they're busy most of the time. They're busy so much that we can only get it maybe six or seven times a year. And I don't think people are aware of that, how busy that place is. And how, you know, I don't, I don't think people complain about the, the traffic necessarily. Maybe they don't know what's going on. But we regularly, when we have big events, we seat 400 people there pretty easily. Uh, and we've had higher numbers of that even on East Beach before the, uh, the pandemic. Um, but so we, what caused the study or what, we, what was the impetus was our need for, we, we can't produce the things that we're producing now uh, given the facilities that we have. So sort of selfishly, we were, we were looking for what else might be possible, what's feasible. But I think there's also a lot of unmet need, too. I mean, I've, I've been involved with community, academic, and professional theater uh, for 45 years. I think there are a lot of uh, uh, frustrated actors on this island. Some maybe have run for office or been elected uh, in, the, in the past. Uh, and I think even a, a local community theater, I think there'd be great interest in that poetry reading, those kinds of things. So when I hear Duncan talk about educational opportunities, things like that in terms of a community center, that, that really excites me beyond just the work that we do as an arts council. I think while you're doing this, um, the arts council information actually becomes very important because they need to tell you how many events they have been able to mount in the last year or the last two years. And say it's 30 a year. And they think they can expand to 45 a year. And some would be small, like poetry readings. That wouldn't be a 600 person event, probably. You also need to find out from the Arts Council though, while you're doing this, how many of the people who do attend their current complement of offerings are from Johns Island or from Seabrook Island, because those are the data points with some extrapolation hmm. you're gonna need to build your assumptions, because you have not had the pleasure of driving from Charleston at 10 at night down a completely dark road to come home from Charleston. But I'm telling you, I doubt a lot of Johns Island people are gonna come down to an event on, in this area and I know people from Charleston are going to have the same attitude. So you have some other concerns, but I think the basic data of how many people they currently draw from Charleston, from Johns Island, from Seabrook would be relevant. So just to answer that question, with our new um, ticket system, we're able to capture all that information now. So all of that information um, is provided to, to the consultant. So um, we're very fortunate that the Arts Council Committee, I think several years ago, may have put this in place because part of the funding that they get is restricted and it has to, they have to market to people at least, I believe, 50 mile radius or 20, 50, 50 mile radius for those restricted funds. 
So um, that's partly why they have to be able to track that information because they are getting funds that's restricted and they have to be able to draw people from 50 miles out. It doesn't say that people are gonna come, but they have to be able to market it and we have to show that we are, we are um, advertising and promoting the events for those funds that, have to, that can't just be for Kiowa residents. As you guys may know or may recognize that um, on some of our events, and I'll let Ruthie and you guys speak more elo eloquently on this, we have where we're able to release some of the tickets for Kiowa residents, you'll see I'll say two or three days prior to the public. That all relates to the way that we're funding it. So that's why you may see those things. Um, and that's why one of the things we're talking regional or local or Johns Island is because how our funding is set up to be able to fund these programs for the community. We're, we're obligated to, to try to reach others outside of Kiowa. Turn it over to you. Yeah, and I can add a little to that that a lot of people don't know in terms of the funding. About a third of the funding comes directly from the town. The funding that Stephanie's talking about, two-thirds is from the accommodations tax that, uh, that people pay when they stay at the resort, the sanctuary, or at the Andell Inn, and that if you're renting uh, a property, you're supposed to pay that tax as well. And that money is supposed to put heads in beds, which means part of what she's talking about is that uh, the folks that get funded from accommodation tax funds the things like marketing the marathon, so the resorts get a chunk of money to market their activities. And LN started a small wedding uh, 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 program, and that money came out of uh, uh, accommodation tax. Dan chaired that committee for several years, so he can, he can tell you all the stories about that and, and where the money comes from. But the purpose of it, and this is state code, basically, that allows us to, to have this tax, is that it's supposed to be for visitors. One of our problems is we cannot program in the summer because West Beach and, and all the resort facilities are pretty much booked solid because that's their business and that's their job. So we're not doing a whole lot for visitors and tourists uh, in the summer. And that's a, that's a question as we get into this is what, what kinds of programming would be viable and do we want to do? Any other arts come? <laughs> Let me, why don't I just, I just want to add a contextual comment just before we do that. So there are, once a site is determined, there will be three things that we will continue arguing about for years. One will be parking, and is there enough? Two will be the, the, having the right number of men's and women's restrooms in the facility. And the third will be the seating capacity of that main space. It is the, it is so hard to narrow in on what that number should be. I absolutely understand the comments that this is for Kiowa audiences, it isn't for other audiences, right? I mean, why, why are we building a place for those people up, up the road? But the reality is that in some cases you say, we want this level of artists to come to our community, and you say, all right, if you want that level of artists, you're going to have to have this many seats in order that the artist fee that they require is something that you'll be able to pay off, right? And then another big argument is, well, we need more seats because we'll make more money. But that's another fallacy. In fact, the more seats you build, the harder it is, the more expensive it is to build and also to sustain. But then on the other hand, some of the users in the community, the renters, they come and say, well, we've got to have you know, 300 seats or whatever in order to make our nut to be able to sort of pay the rent. So it is a, it's a really tricky uh, issue, and it's totally fine that we all disagree. And we can continue to disagree on this for at least a couple more years. And what I find is that the, capa the capacity in the number tends to go up and down a few times before it gets settled. So let's, that's a process. Let's just get all the information out. Let's decide what's most important. Is it about serving local audiences? Is it about bringing high caliber artists? Is it about supporting local arts organizations? Is it about supporting creating new educational opportunities? All of those things will have an influence on that capacity number. So, yes ma'am. I just wanted to add that I think that the establishment of the Arts Council is, was absolutely a brilliant move. And I think it is the singular most important decision made that's enhanced our quality of life here in the islands. Charlie, I don't know if it was you or who had the, the idea first, but uh, what, we're, what we're doing here today is struggling with the enormous success of that concept. It's 
started with Leo Fishman, uh, Bill Wirt, and my good friend down here in the front seat, Bill. Uh, I was thrown into it at the beginning. Be <laughs> I, I was thrown into it at the beginning, and, and I, I just threw my entire self into it, and we, we built it up from the first $25,000 to w what it is now. So, you know, it, it's part of me, and I, it's something that I, I really appreciate. And, of course, uh, it, it has garnered many, many compliments from people who come and visit. We've even had people say that uh, they've, they come to Kiwa in the, in the fall and winter primarily to see these arts events. And uh, so, you know, it, it, it really is, is an amazing thing. My, my issue is, um, and my engineering background, the cost, not only the cost of a physical facility, but the operating cost, you know, the maintenance cost, uh, long term. Another thing to think about, where is it going to, if you build something, where is it going to be built? Probably not in the town of Kew Island, not on Kew Island. Uh, th there's nothing left there, and if you, if you had to buy something, it would be five, five million dollars an acre. So, you know, right away that, that, that shuts you down. So. Th it's a good study, but you need to think of all of these things very, very carefully. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Madeline Kay. Um, I don't envy you the assignment you have ahead of you because fundamentally you have to answer the question that Diane raised earlier, which is do you want to drive people to Kiowa with all of the traffic issues? and, and I don't know how to answer that question. My question is, how does, let's assume the project goes forward, how does it get paid for? Does town council authorize X million of dollars? Um, who, who makes that decision? How is it made? Mm -hmm. Oh, would you like me to answer that question or just your, I'm, you feel my pain? Well, so, um, the, yeah, the question of how it's paid is important. Uh, we're going to address how it is sustained. We're going to talk about long-term sustainability and annual fundraising based on the experience of comparable projects in similar communities, but we're not going to address capital funding and fundraising. And we've always felt it's important to keep kind of a, a firewall between our work and the work of fundraising consultants. The problem is, is you, if you ask about how, how much money is out there too soon, the project gets diminished too soon. So we like to come up with a concept based on the market and based on sustainability. Then you go out and test that with capital campaign fundraiser specialist consultants. And if they come back and say uh, the funding is probably not there for a project of that scale, then you scale it, scale it back to match the resources of the community. But we think it's better to let's develop the right concept from a market and operating perspective and then and then go and test that from a fundraising feasibility perspective. Any other? Anybody else want to comment? Do you still want to? Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, my name is Dylan. I'm one of the newer Arts Council members. Um, anyhow. Oh, sorry. So coming from... We're talking about the function of the building um, and the trajectory of the arts in general with the decline of more traditional, um, like classical uh, theater, et cetera. Um, we have to look at new forms of arts, you know, and, and building that maintain that um, first uh, class performances. Um, when, and a lot of those traditional ones are like what me and my wife came from, which are a circus arts background. And there isn't the, um, as far as facilities on the island go, there's really nothing that we could even possibly conceptualize doing at a budget that would be doable, um, or bringing in a company to do these type of um, next level performances, um, if we're having to look that direction. So let me, I wanna ask a question to the group. How do you feel about uh, bringing the culinary arts into the project? So 
Uh, in lots of our buildings now, we really stress the importance of food and beverage operations. You know, no longer the beer in a pickle concessions. You really need to do better, higher quality things. Uh, have that open during the day so that people can get a coffee or a bite to eat or a beer. Uh, high quality catering for meetings and events. But other buildings are going beyond that. They install an industrial kitchen where you can, you can have cooking classes. Uh, in some buildings, they have, they have what they call a community kitchen where somebody can rent it and come in and say, for example, they want to uh, jar their, their plums. To, so they, they rent the kitchen and they do their sort of processing work to do that. So uh, you can have classes where people do lectures and demonstrations of different culinary traditions. In some places, they like that idea of including the culinary arts, and other places, not so much. So I'm just curious if you think that's something worth considering here. I have the mic, so I'll speak to that. Um, I'm Kristen Thompson. I'm fairly new to the council as well, and I, I'm speaking for two things. Um, I also serve on a, a, as president of the Garden Club. And so culinary arts, gardening, um, looking for facilities here on the island, we have um, uh, Sandcastle, which is Kika, not uh, town. We have the resort facilities, uh, Bobcat Hall over with Kika as well. And it's so difficult, I am only able to get the facilities twice. Every month we have a meeting and twice a, uh, a year I can get the facility because I'm competing with all the other clubs on Kiowa. And it could be a culinary club or it could be a photography club or it could be whatever it is, so um, for that reason, and also all of our arts council events, um, we're trying to wedge things in on certain dates and we just can't, as David said, can't provide those dates, so it really limits what we can provide for people. And we hear from our customers, uh, town, both town and, and Seabrook, and some people from Johns Island, that they would like to have this, that, or the other thing, and we just can't do it, so it's frustrating, but, um, Appreciate hearing everybody else's point of view on this because it's 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 a community thing to talk about. And just one quick um, answer to a question because we just checked on the, the most one of the most recent uh, West uh, Beach events, which was Sam Bush, and a third uh, did not come from Kiowa Island. A third of the audience, so they're already coming from Charleston. I mean, a whole lot of people come to Quentin stuff at Turtle Point, uh, fifty to a hundred. Charleston Jazz, a, a, a third to, to, to a half. So we're already getting a couple of hundred people from, and we don't do any marketing. That's the other thing. We do no advertising. So they, they are, to answer your question, they sort of are coming at night and going, going back at night already. Oh, Liquid Pleasure, even, even yeah. That, it is a lot of Kiowa residents for that, 29544. But we had, we had uh, inquiries from Sam Bush from, way outside of our zip code because it's on their website uh, and there are fans that, that come to these things. They don't. They will go f you know, near and far for, for the stuff. And the same thing is at Freshfields in terms of, because I know Bill uh, has done some uh, marketing research just with uh, who's, who's at Freshfields and, and it's a lot of out of town folks because it's of course you know, in the green and it's an outdoor concert. And they, so we've, we've done that and we, we see it increasing and ticking up especially when we have events that are, uh, I guess, more geared towards a more diverse and younger audience, which I think we, that's another thing we're, we're thinking about. And, and uh, Dylan mentioned about you know, new kinds of performances. Our population is changing, not maybe as, as rapidly as, as some, but uh, it is. And, and we are getting a more diverse uh, population. And, and I think the challenge of the Arts Council is making sure we market to all segments of our, our audiences, not just, not just one. Anyone else? Oh, I thought you were saying. Yes. No. Joan, did you pay attention? Yeah. Hi, I'm Joan Collar. I'm the Arts Council. And uh, to reiterate what some of the things Kristen was saying, I believe that we have an audience of retired, a lot of retired people here that have the time and uh, would be interested in pursuing. Uh, some of the handicraft arts, okay? Woodworking, ceramics, painting. Uh, I personally do silversmithing, okay? Uh, but they could do candle making, 
your culinary arts, and I think this should be an integral part of our art center. Um, it would, uh, depending upon how successful or unsuccessful it is, it would be an incredible thing over the summer when all the kids are here to have, you know, these different classes and such. And there's a great misconception. Uh, I just came from a luncheon, and so many people think that their dues that they pay to Kika is supporting our Arts Council, and they don't want to pay any more dues. And somehow we're going to have to make it known to these people that they pay zero, you know, for our Arts Council. Um, so this is something that um, I think needs, I don't know how you, we get the word around that, but people, even though they hear it, they don't believe it. Anyone else? Yes. I'm John Baumgarten. I'm not on the Arts Council, but I'm married to it. So, uh, I just want to add one, quick, uh, one comment on the traffic issue. Um, and I'm not making a comparison. I have no idea how these two factors would balance out. But the traffic issue is a two-way issue. And the other side of the question is how many of us really appreciate enjoying the arts without having to go and come home on Main Road at night, and without having to go and come back a Bohicket at night. Uh, and at least from my experience in listening to people who attend Arts Council events, that is a major feature and a major attraction and a major source of appreciation for our citizens on what they get from the Arts Council. So I think that should be taken into account as well. Hi, Jody Rush, member of the Arts Council for 10 years now. Um, to those of you who don't know, the Arts Council has been delighting and growing our audience for two decades. We are about ready to celebrate our 20th anniversary, and we have looked to see who our very first performer was, and we'll be inviting his back. Um, he's an incredible pianist, Curtis Institute, Juilliard. We have developed some fabulous artists over the years, and I think that's an incredible um, feather in our cap, uh, young artists from the College of Charleston year after year after year. If you don't come to our events, I would encourage you to pick up a season planner on your way out to look at the incredible variety that we present. You say, is there an audience and for what? Who are the artists organizations? I believe that we have one of the most varied comprehensive schedules of any um, presentation of arts groups I've ever seen. We have classical music, chamber music, vocal, we have blues by the sea, and by the way, I think you have the record for the person who's come the farthest, um, who's come from Minnesota from, for the past 16 years for blues by the sea. Um, going on with what we do, we have jazz, we have um, Quentin Baxter, Grammy winner who curates a program for us and we draw from all over uh, Charleston County and the area. Um, coming up in January, we will have Grammy winner Ranky Tanky. Um, how much are people paying for Ranky Tanky ordinarily? And how much they pay here? 15. Okay, thank you Town of Kiowa, thank you Council. Um, pretty phenomenal program and thank you again uh, to those of you who have said such kind words about the work we do and continue to do. Um, we're just gearing up for our 23-24 season and it will be spectacular. We won't be able to have somebody like Palabolus, who we would love to bring because we don't have theater space. For the first time, we are having flamenco. We are getting a floor and we are gonna have that here as we've wanted to have for years and years. So again, incredible variety, incredible service to the community and thank you for thanking us. I'm Becky Hillstad on the Arts Council for about 15 years, I think. And with Charlie to begin with. Um, so the thing I want to add, because my Arts Council uh, collaborators have already spoken, but I've always seen this as primarily a performance space. Um, I think it should be flexible 
so that we start with a performance area and then have it flexible enough that during the day it could be maybe partitioned so that there could be classes and so on. But I hate to think it gets too elaborate and we try to do all things for all people right from the start and then it's too expensive mm -hmm. and we have to abandon it. Also, I don't think we should be duplicating the services of other places around. We've got the Gilead downtown, we've got North Charleston for the, for the big performances. Uh, we can't always afford those big performances out here. And if people want to go, they can go. But out here, as Jody was just uh, reiterating, we have some great performances. They may not be the big, big names, but they really are very fine performances. And I think that we really need to focus on that we need a space for what we already do for those groups to perform. Period. And then go up to the Anyone else like to say any final words? All right, well, thank you all. Great to, great to hear your points of view. Um, uh, good pointers uh, and instructions for us. Uh, we do have our work cut out for us, but we will look forward to sharing our insights and recommendations back with you uh, in the new year. Uh, happy holidays. Oh, next slide. Oh, right, next slide. I, gotta, I have to share this. Right, so there's two ways that you can reach us. Uh, one is contact at kiwaisland.org, and then you can also go to uh, the website uh, kiwaisland.org slash feasibility study, and that will you will see information on the feasibility study as we're advancing. And for those of you who are tuned in live stream, if you didn't get a well, you didn't get a chance to submit your comments, so you can do that with these links. Right. Okay. Again, happy holidays.